about uh, corporations and um, how the law philosophers and writers and jurists, legal jurists, view corporations and what they say about them. So this is a topic that's discussed in a lot of movies and it's within many of the so-called laws that the government writes. So I was looking through um, some of the public laws put out by the United States and it had uh, artificial, which are these vehicles, and um, as far as your method of transportation. And I, I tried to go back and look at, find the uh, exact public law and page number, and I looked all through the page that I had open and couldn't find it again, but I did read it. It was there, and you can probably find it given a little bit more time and research. But basically, this is the construct, okay? This is what's real, the horse. It's real. It's natural. It's made from nature, from God. And things man-made are considered artificial, okay? And that's basically the long and short of it. Um, it's real easy to understand. It's real easy to grasp, real, okay? Human beings are real. The things they create are artificial. They're fictions, okay? So I've searched through many, many books and many materials, and I'm going to tell you what some of the things um, that I've read say, okay? So what is real? When something is legal, it is supposed to conform to what is real. It is then lawful. Okay, so what is real is um, according to law, because what is uh, artificial is legal. So what is real, such as uh, do no harm? So not doing harm is supposed to conform to the legal system because it's lawful. And everything in the legal system is supposed to be um, in accordance with nature. Okay, so then you have the written and the unwritten Law is, is um, lawful, it's unwritten, but it's still good law. Okay, I have this in blue. Lawful can be unwritten or written, and it's good law when it conforms to nature. Okay, and it can be considered legal once it is written. Okay, so uh, when you go and you um, have like the maxims of law, which are written down, but there are things that we understand to be absolutely true and have stood the test of time. Usually they've been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, do no harm. Okay, do no harm is good law. Uh, much in the legal system um, does allow for harm, and that's bad law. And that means it's not lawful, though it may be legal. Okay, in the written system or legal system, do no harm conforms to the natural law and therefore is lawful. However, immunity is unlawful because it goes against uh, the natural law. Written and performed is legal and also lawful because it conforms to the natural law. Doing harm is wrong. Now, we're not talking about self-defense, okay? Militaries are supposed to be for purposes of self-defense, defense of the country. So you can get together with your fellow man, your fellow neighbors, your fellow countrymen, and defend what is yours against someone performing unlawful acts, okay? And that is lawful as well as legal. So do no harm. There's an exception to the rule, which is self-defense. Okay, so written and performed is legal and also lawful because it conforms to the natural law. Doing harm is wrong, except in self-defense. When a legal thing is not in harmony with the natural law, it is said to be unlawful. Okay. When doing harm is made legal or when someone who does harm is given immunity, when it's not in self-defense, it is not in conformity to the natural law and is an and is unlawful. And I have to add here also in defense of another. So when you call the police and the police show up and they shoot or disarm or disable or injure someone who is doing a harm to another person, that is in accordance with natural law. It's defense of another. 
Okay, so taxation is theft. Even if you agree to it, it's still theft. Taxes are unlawful. Taxes do harm. Force is harm. Force is unlawful. Immunity uh, for performing a harm is unlawful. Immunity is wrong unless it's in self-defense or defense of another. So if someone is posing no threat to another person and the police come in and shoot them or injure them, that is unlawful. It should be illegal. Um, many times, uh, as we've seen in recent history, the so-called um, lawyers and judges uh, seek immunity for unlawful and illegal acts. Real is an important word in the legal system. Okay, maxim, not what you create, you control. Okay, real things are the human beings, the um, animals, plants, the earth, and the things that man creates, as I showed you earlier, like a vehicle, are artificial. So that which you create, which are artificial things, you are supposed to control them. Okay, that is also along the lines of the master cannot also be the servant, and the tenant cannot also be the landlord. You're either one or the other. You're either the creator or you are created. We humans are created by God and we create things. And just as God controls us, we're supposed to control our creations. Okay, the principles of the law, the principles of natural law. Okay, natural law. We likewise observe that, and this is the, the name of the book. Okay, and this is in the book. We likewise observe that appearances frequently deceive us, okay? And um, so when we decide what's real, we look at a car and we say, well, it's real, I can touch it, you know, but it's in the law considered um, artificial. And we're deceived by this idea that just because we could see it and feel it, that it's real. So Appearances frequently deceive us, and what at first sight carries with it the force of good provides proves to be actually evil, while it's an apparent evil oftentimes conceals an extraordinary good. We should therefore make a distinction between real goods and evils, and those that are false or false and apparent, or which amounts to pretty near the same thing. There is sometimes a pure good and a pure evil, and sometimes there is a mixture of both, which does not obstruct our discerning which part it is that prevails and whether the good or evil be predominant. Okay, so I'm going to explain what this means. Okay, so we have laws that appear good, but actually allow for a harm to be done. Okay, that's an evil. We have... Um, a military that goes across the ocean and um, attacks people who have done no one any harm. That's an evil. But they say, well, it's for our own good because they're making a weapons of mass destruction. But then when we uh, investigate further, we find out there's no weapons of mass destruction. Okay, so this is what it's talking about. It's, it's saying that we're, we're deceived. And I talked about that in the military in the army manual, the field manual, where it talks about uh, deceptive practices, okay? These are things well known in hu humanity among men that there are many deceptions that take place. And you're told, well, this is, we need to do this because of this or that or whatever, just like the mask. We're told we need to wear a mask, it saves lives. We need to get a vaccine, it saves lives. Meanwhile, there's not a whole lot of evidence to support it and there's a lot of evidence supporting that um, people are injured from uh, wearing masks and getting vaccines but what we don't see predominantly is who gains uh, something from people getting vaccines and getting uh, buying masks which are the pharmaceutical com companies and oftentimes uh, the politicians who promote those things okay so here's a first Book of Jurisprudence for Students of the Common Law by Pollock. He says, but in the Middle Ages, a man could renounce his whole legal personality, his whole legal personality, public and private, become as what 
It was called Civilly Dead by entering one of the regular orders of religion, and this may possibly be so still in some of the jurisdictions where the Roman Catholic religion is exclusively or principally recognized by the state and is monastic and other societies of professed religious persons have an official standing. Note, um, this is not part of the book, this is just my note, this is not the same type of government of America where there is a separation of church and state. Also, the origin original meaning of the Constitution allowed for a person to act on his own behalf and take official steps to become a member or become in service to the public as a public servant to the government, originally requiring him to fill out an application and submit it to the court of record um, of the state in which he was an inhabitant in and prior to running for Congress must have been accepted as a public servant for the federal government and the state but not an inhabitant of the state, meaning that he had to live and work on the federal lands and dedicated service to become a, a servant to the federal government for seven years, um, a representative, nine years, a senator, and 14, the president. So what this is saying is that um, we have a separation between church and state that's in the Constitution. and. And it's not that you have to become a member of the church um, as the act or deed. It's that you have to actually do the act or deed to become a public servant. Okay, so it's sort of flipped on its head in America. So, for example, Nikola Tesla, a non-combative personality, was to leave to fight in the military of his country. His parents, however, wanted him to join the church so that he could avoid military service. Plus his father was in, in the church. He was a, a minister of some, some sort. However, Tesla did not want to become a member of the church, so his parents pretended that he was too ill to leave for military service to help him out of both military service and religious service. Okay, and after he was said to be better and the war was over, he uh, emigrated to America. Okay, a treatise on the laws of private corporations. Every corporation should have a name by which it is to sue and be sued. Okay, so a lot of times we find that corporations, um, they have many names, but they use one that the public is aware of, and then they file all sorts of papers and act under other corporate names to which you don't know the name of and you can't find the name of because we can't find their charters. So they're supposed to be chartered with the uh, Congress of the United States, yet um, where are those charters? Uh, I haven't been able to find them so far. I've asked around. Nobody seems to know what I'm talking about. Um, they're supposed to have a certificate of, an incorpor of incorporation. Where are they kept? I don't know. If anybody knows, can you post it in the comments? Because I'd like to follow up and do some research on it. So every corporation should have a name by which it is to sue and be sued and do all legal acts. The name of incorporation, says Sir Edward Koch, is a proper name or a name of baptism. And therefore, when a private founder gives his college or hospital a name, he does it only as a godfather. And by that same name, the king baptizes the corporation. But though the name of a corporate body is compared to the Christian name of a natural person, yet the comparison is not in all respects perfectly correct. A Christian name consists in general, but of a single word, such as Oliver or Robert, in which the alteration or omission of a single letter may make a material or may make a material alteration in the name. And I did see in another book that, um, for example, when a king was ordained, they would take his name, Bill Smith, baptize him, give him a new name like um, King Philip give him a certificate of baptism, sort of like a certificate of an incorporation, and he would thereby be incorporated into the Catholic Church as one of its, um, I guess, employees or um, corporate, uh, like sort of a stockholder, joint stockholder. I guess you could look at it that way. So Bruno, who resumed for the time his baptism name of Filippo, journeyed First to the picturesque little town of Noli in the Gulf of Genoa, whether, whither a more famous exile, Dante, had also come. So that's just a little blurb that was in the book that tells you that Bruno was his 
was his name, but then he was baptized as Filippo. Okay, so in section 9102, we see establishing and acquiring corporations. An agency may establish or acquire a corporation to act as an agency only by or under a law of the United States, specifically authorizing the action. Okay, and uh, as far as I can tell, there's no law um, in the Constitution. There's nothing in the Constitution that allows Congress to make these sorts of laws. They're allowed to make contracts, but the contracts are all supposed to be for defense purposes, not to um, wield a sort of force against the American people. But what this is saying, that the agencies and departments are allowed to then um, establish or acquire a corporation to do work for it. Okay, there's nothing in the, in the Constitution that allows for any agency to act against individuals. And Ron Paul has said that on his show many times, as well as uh, Daniel McAdams and probably Chris Rossini, also his regular guest. Okay, you can go back and look at some of those shows. And also it's in uh, a book on the federal government by Upshur. Okay, register. This is a definition an officer authorized by law to keep a record called a register or registry, a book of public acts such as births, deaths, and marriages, also called a registry, or the public official who keeps uh, such book. Other examples of public record books are the register of patents. Okay, and the patents and trademarks was supposed to be for, of course, defense purposes. And what they were supposed to do was um, when they um, invented new weapons or new methods of doing things that it could be registered and patented to the um, inventor or creator so that he could um, receive some compensation. But just like any corporation, when they hire you and you do work for them, they basically own all your research. So the government's saying that they'll give you 50 years of your, of your um, rights to your, your creations, and then after that, it reverts back upon them. Okay, so deaths, marriages, or public officials who keep such a book. Other examples of public records are the Register of Patents, a list of all patents granted, and the Register of Ships kept by Customs, other examples of public record keeping officials are the register of copyrights, register of deeds, land records, and the register of wills, clerk of probate court. They're often called recorder or registrar. See also federal register. Okay. The federal register is a list of publications. Okay. Nothing is, no one's bound to follow anything if it's not in the federal register. That's what the federal register says. Um, but the Federal Register is also simply a list of things that the federal government is supposed to do unto itself, okay, not to other people. And it does it also to its creations. Only slaves are counted, enumerated, numbered, social security number, driver's license number. Slaves have no head. Slaves have no property. Slaves are registered. Okay, so we go back up here to the note. Okay, and this is what I'm saying here. When a person of the state who's an inhabitant wants to become a citizen of the United States and have his years of service counted towards his um, right to run for representative, senator, or president, he is registered, okay? He's in a court of record. It's a record. It's a book. It's a log. It's kept. It's a legend. Okay, it's a list of people who are on the federal lands who are called citizens of the United States or United States citizens, and um, they're public servants, they're in service to the public, they're a member, they're under oath, and they're registered as citizens of the United States. These are the slaves, okay, because only slaves are counted, and the Social Security number was, an ori was originally for the members of the federal government. Okay, it's a federal government number issued by the federal government for federal officers and employees. Okay, but if you want to be a part of that, they'll give you the number and along goes with that federal taxes, which were never intended to be for, for um, people not on federal lands. The Institutes of American Law, Volume 1, 
136 to 143. This is in the footnote. And I apologize if I get any of these words um, wrong. But at Rome, by state, was understood the inscription of the name of an individual on the registers or census. Okay, I don't, I don't do the census. I don't fill them out. When the census guy comes to my door, I spray him with the water hose and I tell him to get the hell on out of here. He tries to tell me it's the law and I said, no, it's not. It's not the law for me because the laws don't, the laws don't include me because I'm an individual. I'm private. You're public. The laws are for the public. The state was the same as caput, head. Capite, sensi, was meant those who had declared to the censors that they had nothing of their own. I have nothing of my own. I'm going to do the census and tell you I have nothing of my own. I don't think so. Neither property nor posterity. Hmm. Okay. They're slaves. They, they have no posterity. They could then be numbered only by their heads. None were inscribed on the list or census except freemen, citizens, and heads of families. And thus the word head, kaput, signified simply a state of liberty, of citizenship, and of family. The slave who was deprived of all state was said to have no head. Caput non haber. Um, so there's a lot of stuff in the in the laws that Congress has passed that go against the Constitution. Okay, and they have turned everything on its heads, turned it upside down, made you believe, made us believe, made themselves believe things that um, just aren't true. Okay, so do you think? This is my question here. Do you think God would be offended if he found another man was counting his children? Because in the Bible it says, uh, it speaks against being numbered, having a number, right? The mark of the beast. Okay, let's look at what writers say. Okay, so individual, this is a definition as a noun, because we're individuals, we're private citizens. When you go into the public, you're a group, okay? And you're supposed to be watched over and um, you're supposed to be transparent. Everything you do is supposed to be transparent. But when you're a private person, you're outside of that, okay? This term denotes a single person as distinguished from a group or class. So the government has never been able to have control over individuals they're, um, they have control over the classes of people, and the class of people that they have control over are the citizens of the United States who are supposed to be on the federal lands. That's the class. Um, and also, very commonly, a private or natural person is an individual, not controlled by government, as distinguished from a partnership, a corporation, or an association. Okay, Congress is an association, it's a corporation, it's a partnership. Okay, but, but it is said that this restrictive signification is not necessarily inherent in the word and that it may, in proper cases, include artificial persons. Okay, so, so when an individual forms a corporation, even if he's by himself or an association, he can be then a... Um, a legal person, okay, a public person, okay, but when he's just by himself in his natural state, and that does not mean that he can't run a business or anything like that. It, there's a separation here. There's a separation between like a public and private, okay? Private people can act um, as a business person running a small business uh, lawfully, Okay, and they're private and they're still an individual, but when an individual does something in the public as far as trying to uh, wield a sword over people or control people for some purpose, then um, he's an individual, but also the people in government are also individuals and responsible for their individual acts. So public servants are responsible for their acts individually. Okay, so each member of Congress you don't um, look at Congress and say, well, you're a corporation, so if one does something bad, you're all bad, but you look at them also as individuals because they're, they're a single part of a whole. Okay, I hope that makes sense. As an adjective, individual means 
pertaining to or belonging to or characteristic of one single person, either in opposition to a firm, association, or corporation, or considered in his relation thereto. Okay, so you can be either as part of a corporation or um, not part of a corporation. Individual still means something. And so when there's um, a part of the law that it says that it applies to human beings, individuals, and such and such, and that doesn't mean that it applies to private people. That doesn't mean that it applies to everybody. It still only applies to the people who are within its sphere a um, single member of a group or class. Okay, so Hillary Clinton, Nancy Pelosi, Harry Reid, Biden, Kamala, they're all individuals responsible for their own actions, but they come under the law of the federal government or the state government because they have joined in the membership of public service. The distinction is an individual may be natural or artificial. However, artificial laws or entities cannot command what is natural. They only command what is artificial. So statutes, codes, regulations, they only include the classes of people, which include the individuals within that class. Okay. Person. In general usage, a human being, i.e. a natural person, though by statute term, may include labor organizations, partnerships, associations, corporations, legal representatives, trustees, trustees and bankruptcies and receivers. Now remember, um, we said something earlier about agencies being able to um, create corporations to act for them. And there are persons that create those corporations and those persons may be individuals. Uh, and together they form a group or class called a um, partnership, joint stock company, association, corporation, etc. And so when it talks about those people, it's talking about them in their legal sense, not their natural sense. Okay, the, the natural person are, are those outside of that. Okay, so all the rest of us not in government. Okay, so here we have the same distinction. The government uses statutes to control what is artificial, but not what is natural. Even when a natural person is acting as a fiction, the government claims to control the fiction, not the natural person, or that is the individual. Okay, because we, we, um, we don't have, um, a, if you don't register with the federal government, they don't have control over you. That's basically what that means. So if you're registered with the federal government, you're, you're registered as one of the class of people that it um, uh, claims to have control over, okay? That which you create, you control. So when you get a birth certificate, you're then created. Okay, so here is the, um, the one section I was talking about, and this is... Um, not sure which title, okay, Title One, U.S. Code, Section 8, person, not what you create, you control. Person, human being, child, and individual as included, born alive, infant. So what it's talking about here when it says child are dependents of the military, okay? Uh, they're required, originally by law, they're required to live on the federal lands, and when those military members had children, those children were born on the federal lands and therefore born as a citizen of the United States, not naturalized as the person who left the state and became a citizen of the United States on the federal lands. So you can go to Title I, U.S. Code Section 8, and uh, read this. And I have a note down here. I'm not going to read that. Um, the government did not create private persons. Therefore, they or it does not control private persons. When Washington, George Washington retired from service to the public, he became a private citizen. Washington and the American Republic is a book. Washington, now a private citizen, hastened to his... Um, um, beloved home on the Potomac, accompanied on the way by many friends, among whom was Colonel Walker one of the aides of the Baron Steuben, 
By his hand, he sent a letter to Governor George Clinton, the first that he wrote after his retirement from office, in which he said, the scene is at last closed. It's funny how he uses scene. Theater, right? A legal person, an artificial person, a fiction. Um, I am now a private citizen on the banks of the Potomac. I feel myself eased of a load of public care. I hope to spend the remainder of my days in cultivating the affections of good men and in the practice of the domestic and the word ran off the page and I didn't see the rest, but you can look it up in this book. Um, George Washington and the American Republic. You can find it online. Man subjects himself. Okay, an older version of Title II, Congress, Chapter 8, the Federal Corrupt Practices, Section 241, Definition F. The term person includes an individual, an individual within government, a single member of Congress, a single member of the military, a single member of one of the corporations it creates. That's what individual, human being, a um, person, a dependent, Okay, so the term person includes all those things, all those people, partnership, committee, association, corporation, or any, any other organization or group of persons because the federal government controls classes of people. These are the artificial people. These are not the real people. These are fictions. Okay, everything the government creates is a fiction because I'm not going to tell you why. I'll tell you at the end. Austin's Theory of Positive Law and Sovereignty, page 57. <clears throat> can a man be subject to himself? A power over a person which cannot be exercised without that person's consent it is no power over him at all. A person is subordinate to a body of which he is himself a member, only if that body has power to act, notwithstanding his dissent. Now, when man submits himself to the power over him exercised, he becomes subject to the jurisdiction. See the 14th Amendment. Birth certificate is a legal document. Is the creation of a statutory person, a statute written by government. Therefore, name on birth certificate is a creation of a legal entity which is fictional or artificial and controlled by government. Same with the Social Security number, the driver's license number, anything registered with government, states created by government, address, the address created by the government, the legal descriptions created by government, like the legal description of your property. Again, your property is registered with the government. Your name is registered with the government. Your business is registered with the government. Your license is registered with the government. Your vote is registered with the government. Your child is registered with the government. Your future is registered with the government and controlled by them. Persons are divided into natural and artificial. Okay, some of these, um, I apologize that I don't have the book names for some of these. I do a lot of screenshots um, and then I name them so that I can search my computer and go back and find what a particular thing said. And I've included those in here, but um, I didn't always keep the uh, source, but uh, I assure you these are all from various books, okay? Persons are divided into natural and artificial. These will be concerted. Oh, if you want to find these, you can just put this whole thing into Google and it'll come up with the book if Google has it somewhere. It'll come up with the book. Um, persons are divided into natural and artificial. These will be considered separately. Men, women, and children are called natural persons, but in another sense by person is meant the part which a man plays the part which a man plays in society because it's not real. It's artificial. This is the construct. In law, man and person are not exactly synonymous terms. Any human being is a man, whether he be a member of society or not. And whatever may be the rank he holds, whatever may be his age, his sex, etc. Natural persons in law such as are formed by God in opposition to artificial persons or those formed into corporations by human laws for purposes of government or society. Okay, however, what is society? What is community? His local government? 
his state or state, his family, his federal government? Did he register all he has with a specific society? Did he agree to pay federal taxes to a specific society? If so, he became artificial member of the society and therefore controlled by it. Introduction to Austin's theory. Since Austin's time, no responsible writer has said, as Blackstone once said, the law of nature is binding over all the globe. The law of nature, not the law of man. The law of nature is binding over all the globe and all the countries. No human laws are of any validity if contrary to this. This is what I was trying to explain earlier when I started reading this paper, is that the legal things are, are for artificial, for men to act as artificial beings in society. But what society? The federal society? The state society? We don't have to be a part of that if we don't want to, okay? Um, whatever laws they make, they're of no validity if they're, are, if they're contrary to what's uh, in, natural, in nature and what's natural. This is explained in an ancient maxim that says man cannot be compelled to do the impossible. So if you're, if you're being forced to pay taxes at the expense of not having food to eat, that's being compelled to do the impossible. Okay. If you're being forced to pay some corporation taxes and you don't even know really where that corporation begins and where it ends and all the names that it's acting under or what it's using the money for, I would say that you're being compelled to do something that is impossible. Okay, the nature of the corporation as a legal entity by James Carter, page, it's a PDF, page 76 of 263. One interpretation of this fiction, therefore, is the deduction that since only a human being can exercise will, the corporate entity must be regarded as a human being since it is not one. In fact, it is therefore a fictitious person. Okay? One interpretation of this fiction, therefore, is the deduction that only a human being can exercise will. The corporate entity must be regarded as a human being. But since it is not one, in fact, it is therefore a fictitious person. This is the construct, the real thing and the fictitious thing, the lawful thing and the legal thing. Uh, another interpretation goes a step further back. It concludes that the entity itself is unreal. That is that the entity itself does not exist, but must be regarded as existing in the legal system to support the rights the law confers upon it. Hence, it must be regarded also as exercising a will since it has, likewise, no will. In fact, the fiction must attribute to the corporation the wills of the individual members. The individual members. That's what it's saying. The individual members of the corporation registered to do business with the federal government are fictions which are controlled by the laws, the legal system, which is also fictions. Fictions for fictions. Okay, so it appears that a government, which is a fiction, okay, I told you I'd tell you what it is. So it appears that a government, which is a fiction, or the courts created by it and for it, which are also fictions, are deeming themselves as humans and deciding that the other things created by men, but are not in fact men, are men to confer the rights upon it as if they are men, born of God and having God-given rights. However, as stated in other writings, many philosophers skip what they do not want to address, which are the things that prove them which are the things that prove them wrong. Therefore, court cases, laws, Congress, etc., never mention that corporations are not biological entities. Okay? They are not biological entities. They exist on paper, and the biological entities ensure the paper is um, I don't know why I didn't finish that. They exist on paper and the biological entities ensure the paper is um, pushed forward or moved to achieve a means to an end because that's what corporations originally were intended to do to achieve a means to an end. Okay, 
that was their sole purpose to achieve a means to an end. And once the end was achieved, then they were supposed to be um, dissolved. Okay, so um, in fact, in uh, reality, real, these are all very important things to consider and understand when you're reading law, okay? Uh, a corporation is an intellectual body politic created by law uh, composed of one or more persons who act under a common name are endowed with perpetual secession, which is um, a fiction because nothing can live perpetually and with various other powers by its charter or the law which created it and which for certain purposes is considered as a natural person. It is as well observed by Chief Justice Marshall and art of, okay, so Chief Justice Marshall says that corporations are an artificial being, an intangible, invisible, and existing only in contemplation of law. Another phrase you need to be aware of and research and understand. In contemplation of law, a corporation created by and doing business in a particular state, state, this is uh, in general, the general use of the word, it is to be deemed in all intents and purposes as a person, an inhabitant of that state. And for the purposes of this incorporation as a citizen of that state, the residence of its stockholders does not affect in any way the citizenship of the corporation. So this was really a stretch um, to try to make corporations more than what they actually were to um, pretend that they could live in existence forever, um, that they didn't have a means to an end, that they were perpetual. And in my opinion, this is a, just a, a gross usurpation of the original intention of a corporation because there are other writings that state that the corporation is created, it serves a purpose. When the purpose is achieved, it ends. A corporation cannot commit a crime so if it cannot commit a crime, um, does it actually have a will? Nor a misdemeanor through its office, though its officers may, while acting on its behalf, do both. They alone will be responsible. Nor can such a body commit any forcible injury as trespass. Okay, so the individuals are the ones with the will and they are the ones responsible for moving the corporation. And so they are responsible for the... Um, acts of the corporation and they're the ones that have to serve um, purpose, uh, serve time if they're uh, deemed guilty of a crime or they have to right the wrong that they've, um, that they've committed as far as any injury to a person or a trespass upon any person. So um, that's why they need you to be a legal person so that you can become a member of the corporate body. And then when you do something, they put your real body in, in jail and um, make you pay for injury. Okay, does this sound familiar? The IRS possibly? Um, putting people in jail or prison over money, not giving them money. I mean, does that sound right? The genius corporation defined. This is the title of the book. The definition of a corporation most familiar to American jurisprudence is that of Chief Justice Marshall, which declares a corporation to be an artificial being, invisible, intangible, and existing only in contemplation of law. You cannot see it. You cannot smell it. You cannot hear it. You cannot taste it. It is therefore artificial. It has no will. Being the mere creature of law, it possesses only those properties which the charter of its creation confers upon it, either expressly or as incidental to its very existence. The person in imagination of persona ficta of the corporation, Maximilian Kostler, introduction. Okay, so the history of the person in, in imagination or persona ficta can be traced back to the Middle Ages. In the law of the Catholic Church, this sinister child of conceptualistic thought sprang up. See, this is a sinister. This comes from the Catholic Church. 
That's what they did with the bab baptism certificates, was they created an artificial being with a certificate of baptism to incorporate a man as in, into the church as a member, and then that person could be controlled, his legal person could be controlled. They call it a sinister child in this book. They call it a sinister child of conceptualistic thought that sprang up from case law concerning certain legal problems that had high actuality in those days. It was originally a figure of speech, the metaphoric expression of a dogmatic fiction which was believed to be needed for a functional purpose. Okay? It was believed to be needed for a functional purpose. And there's a lot written that says corporations served a purpose when the purpose was completed they were they went away it should help to recuperate a convenient lawyer's tool possessed under different names by the roman law but forgotten by subsequent generations reference is herewith made to the possibility of attaching the status of a separate legal entity or of rights and duties bearing unit to something which is not a human individual but an organization of several human beings or an institution. Perhaps it is well to remember in this connection that legal personality is not a necessary adjunct to the physical existence of a human individual. Okay, a legal personality is not necessary to the existence of a human individual. On the other hand, law may attribute this capacity to a social organism or to a social institution, in other words, to something different from a human individual. So the social institution was the federal government for defense purposes. Okay, that's, that's all the federal government was supposed to be for, for defense purposes. It had three things it had to do. Uh, declare war, make treaties for peace, and then declare peace. Okay. So these individuals that were originally supposed to be part of that were just the military members in Congress. Okay, and then it's just expanded and expanded and expanded. When the dogmatic fiction personifying separate legal entities other than human individuals had conquered the legal world, the term person, originally the exclusive designation of man, came in addition to mean any rights and duties bearing unit. And then lawyer's vocabulary, the moral or juristic person, was thus added to the natural person. Okay, so it was added later um, for these uh, sinister purposes that sprang up to achieve a means to an end, whether it be good or evil. It is clear that at this stage of development, person, even if used without regard to any entity different from a human individual, ceased to be a metaphor. Okay, so it was originally a metaphor, okay, but was a plain reference to something existing as it was referred to. Without any figure of speech involved at this time, the question whether the juristic person is real or imaginary. Is he in fact or is he a metaphor? Is he true? Is he, is he a creation of God or is he man's creation? Okay, so real or imaginary should never uh, have been seriously advanced. It was never a serious, it was never, sh never should have been a serious question. You know, it's, it's um, rather stupid. Rather should the phrase be persona ficta. Okay, and then the opposite of that would be non persona ficta, not a, a fiction, fictional person or fictional person or not a fictional person or its equivalent in modern language has been jettisoned as an intellectual ballast, as something which has become obsolete by losing its original sense. So it's the legal entity is the, um, is the equivalent in modern language, the legal entity, your legal person. Okay, legal entity. The term legal entity means an entity that is created under federal or state law and this is an actual definition from a book, from a dictionary. I like the old ones. Okay, the term legal entity means an entity that is created under federal or state law and that owns land or an agricultural commodity or produces an agricultural commodity. Okay, so it's not talking about private people who own private land and perform agricultural 
you know, agricultural acts on their own private land. They're talking about those under federal or state law. So they have to be registered. Okay, now, through history and even now, the government would contract with some of these private people to bring them under it so that it could uh, have food for its military members because it's three hots and a cot you're promised when you join the military. In Rome, the emperor would give common lands to poor people to produce agricultural products on, and in return, they paid a quote-unquote tax, which was simply a portion of their yield produced produced from the gifted lands. So they didn't pay for the lands. They just promised to give Caesar what is Caesar's, his yield, and they called it a tax. That's the oldest um, thing I can find on tax, okay? And contemplation of law. The American Law Register founded 1852, University of Pennsylvania, Department of Law, January 1899, an inquiry into the nature and law of corporations. What did I tell you government was? It's a fiction. It's a corporation. We have found a corporation to be an artificial person existing in contemplation of law as a subject of certain as yet undefined property rights, but that is no more than to say that a corporation is an artificial person since, as we have already found, all artificial persons exist in contemplation of law as the subject of certain property rights, the absence of the rights of persons we have found to distinguish artificial persons from natural persons, as the persons composing such association had no right to act in its name in it contemplation or it in contemplation of law simply does not exist. What did I tell you the government was? The lawyers and jurists, barristers, advocates, and legal consultants. You can find this at lawyersandjurists.com. I think I got that right. I'm sure you can Google it if I didn't. Barristers, advocates, and legal consultants. This is right on their webpage. A corporation is an artificial being, invisible, intangible, and existing only in contemplation of law. It has neither mind nor body of its own. It cannot, cannot move on its own when the people are not there, it disappears, it no longer exists, even if it's written on paper. It takes a will of individual human beings to move it. A corporation is an inst institution that is granted a charter and receives a certificate of an incorporation. A charter is the grant of authority or rights, stating that the grantor formally recognizes the prerogative of the recipient, recipient to exercise the rights specified. It goes on. Note, other philosophers state that real things have senses, as in the five senses, artificial things do not. Okay, and that's my note. If you want to read more here, go there, check it out. And this is what I have read. Other philosophers say anything on paper does not have senses. It does not have will. A sixth sense, it doesn't have that. Black's Law, 5th edition. Artificial as opposed to natural means created or produced by man. California uh, Causality Indemnity Exchange versus Industrial Accident Compensation of California. Created by art or by law. Existing only by force or of or in contemplation of law. Humanly contrived. A will or contract is described as artificially drawn if it is couched in apt and technical phrases and exhibits a scientific arrangement. Chief Justice Marshall in the Dartmouth College uh, cases defines or rather characterizes a corporation again as an artificial being, invisible, intangible, existing only in contemplation of law. Jurisprudence or the Theory of the Law by John Solomon, Chapter 15, Persons, Section 109, The Nature of Personality. You can Google this. It'll come up. Conversely, there are, in the law, persons who are not men. A joint stock company or a municipal corporation is a person in legal contemplation. 
it is true that it is not that it is only a it is true that it is only a fictitious not real person but it is not a fictitious man italicized it is personality not human nature that is fictitiously attributed by the law to bodies corporate so far as legal theory as legal theory is concerned a person is any being whom the law regards as capable capable of rights and duties. Any being that is so capable is a person, whether a human being or not. No being that is not so capable is a person, even though he be a man. Persons are the substances of which rights and duties uh, are uh, the attributes. It is only in this respect that persons possess judicial significance. And this is exclusive point of view from which personality receives legal recognition. It is only in this respect that persons possess juridical significance. And this is the exclusive point of view from which personality receives legal recognition. A person then may be defined for the purposes of law as any being to whom the law attributes a capability of interest and therefore of rights, of acts, and therefore of duties. Persons also defined are of two kinds, distinguishable as natural and then legal. A natural person is a being to whom the law attributes personality in accordance with reality and truth. Legal persons are beings real or imaginary to whom the law attributes personality by way of fiction when there is none in fact. Legal persons are persons in fact as well as in law. Legal persons are persons, I'm sorry I said that wrong. Natural persons are persons in fact as well as in law. Legal persons are persons in law but not in fact. Okay? Mark that. Personification, so personality, in itself is a mere metaphor, not a legal fiction. Legal personality is a definite legal conception. Personification, as such, is a mere artifice of speech devised for compendious expression. But legal personality is not reached until the law recognizes over and above the associated individuals, a fictitious being which in a manner represents them but is not identical with them. Bentham set the fashion, still followed by many of, uh, many of denying that there are any such things as natural rights at all. All rights are legal rights in the creation of the law. Uh, natural law, natural rights, he says, are two kinds of fictions or metaphors which play so great a part in books of legislation that they deserve to be examined by themselves. Rights, properly so called, are the creatures of law, properly so called. Real laws give rights to legal rights. I'm sorry, real laws give rise to real rights. Natural rights are the cre uh, creatures of natural law. They are a metaphor which derives its orig origin from another metaphor. Chambers Etymological Dictionary Contemplation. Okay, I'm not going to read that. All this results in human equity. Okay, using you so that they can gain advantage. The philosophers of the period gave evidence that they knew more than they dared to express in simple language. There is no better evidence needed than the reciprocity of fear between the strong and the weak. The fear of the strong that the weak might discover that they are equally strong would be a tacit admission of fear on the part of the strong. So they want you to feel weak so that they can maintain control. But once you realize you're not and you're strong, that's what that's when they become afraid okay so I hope you enjoyed this video hopefully it wasn't too long I'm sorry I had to read it to you some things are just better said the way they were originally said and um, you can google any of these quotes uh, and 
you can usually find lots of stuff um, on the internet or the exact book where I found some of this stuff, um, including, you know, con a contemplation of law is probably the hardest thing there's been for me to find. There's not a whole lot written on it. There's some, but there's not a whole lot. So um, you can look up anything in this um, paper that I read from, basically, and find something on the internet from it to read more on it if you so choose. But basically what it's saying is most of what government does and government itself, it's all just fiction. It's all just contemplation of law. They're artificial beings um, and they're, they're trying to exert force over people because that's where it gets its life from. And in order for it to be able to continue doing that, it needs to make you afraid so that you will fear it and you will think that it is strong when really it's weak and it's so weak that it fears you so much that it has to make you fearful. Okay, um, so please like, share, and subscribe. And if you can't do two of those things, just subscribe. Um, comments in the sec comment section if you like. And check out some of my other videos if you like this one. And um, you guys have a great day.